Finally tonight, Africa and America on President Clinton's last day in Africa. We begin with a report from Spencer Michaels. An island in the Atlantic Ocean evoking painful memories of slavery was the last stop on President Clinton's 11-day six-nation visit to Africa. It was the most extensive tour of the continent ever made by an American president and covered agendas that ranged from America's centuries-old relationship with Africa to such modern issues as trade and economics, education, and environmental protection. But it was to the most troubling part of the past that Mr. Clinton returned today, Gare Island off Senegal's coast, where millions of Africans began forced journeys to the New World that ended either in their death or in slavery on plantations in America or on islands in the Caribbean. In these dramatic surroundings, Mr. Clinton delivered the final speech of his African tour. Gory Island is as much a part of our history as a part of Africa's history. From Gory and other places, Africa's sons and daughters were taken through the door of no return, never to see their friends and families again. America's struggle to overcome slavery and its legacy forms one of the most difficult chapters of that history. Yet it is also one of the most heroic, a triumph of courage, persistence, and dignity. The long journey of African Americans proves that the spirit can never be enslaved. From the start of the trip in Ghana, where the Clintons received an enthusiastic welcome, to the end, Mr. Clinton mused about the present and the past. The president and the first lady were presented an African kenti cloth. In Uganda, the president and first lady were again received in celebratory fashion. But in one speech, Mr. Clinton dwelled on what he called historic neglect of Africa in the past. I think it is worth pointing out that the United States has not always done the right thing by Africa. But perhaps the worst sin America ever committed about Africa was the sin of neglect and ignorance. We have never been as involved with you in working together for our mutual benefit, for your children and for ours, as we should have been. And in a brief stop in Rwanda, where a genocidal war occurred in 1994, killing hundreds of thousands, the president spoke of the failure of the U.S. and the international community to intervene sooner. We did not act quickly enough after the killing began. We should not have allowed the refugee camps to become safe havens for the killers. We did not immediately call these crimes by their rightful name genocide. In South Africa, the president traveled to the prison where Nelson Mandela was held for nearly two decades by the white apartheid government before his release that paved the way to black majority rule. At a news conference earlier that day, Mr. Clinton was asked if the slowness of the U.S. and the West to act in Rwanda was due to racism. I don't believe there was any racial element in our slow response. I do believe that generally America has been, uh, and the whole American policy apparatus, has been less responsive and less involved in uh, Africa than was warranted. I think that's a general problem. But I think in the case of Rwanda, what I believe we have got to do is to, to establish a system uh, hopefully through the United Nations, which gives us an early warning system that gives us the, the means to go in and try to stop these things from happening before they start. But not all of the trip was policy and work. The first couple had a break in Botswana and went on a safari. Back at work in Botswana and then Senegal, the president called for stronger environmental protection and he reiterated his support for an international peacekeeping force to head off future conflicts and civil wars in Africa. The President and the First Lady are returning to Washington late today. 
Elizabeth Barnesworth takes the story from there. Joining us now with four African perspectives are C.K. Lazepo, who is from Ghana. He chairs the African Music and Dance Program at the University of California, Berkeley. He also performs in a traveling group, the African Music and Dance Ensemble. And Chinwa Achebe, who's from Nigeria. He's a novelist, poet, and playwright who teaches literature at Bard College. His first book, Things Fall Apart, published in 1958, has been translated into more than 50 languages and sold more than 8 million copies. And Gugi Wathyongo, who is Kenyan. He's an author and playwright who teaches comparative literature at New York University. His books, including Decolonizing the Mind, The Politics of Language in African Literature, have been translated into more than 20 languages. He's been in exile since 1982. And Mandai Muyongwa, a native of Zambia, is research director for the National Summit on Africa, a private organization that promotes U.S.-African relations. Thank you all for being with us. And Mr. Achebe, starting with you, as a novelist whose stock in trade is symbols, what do you think of the symbolic visits to Garay Island and other sites of the slave trade that, mis that the president has made? Well, I think it is an appropriate uh, thing to do um, because you cannot think of the relationship between Africa and the West, or Africa and America in particular, without thinking of the slave trade. Uh, therefore, I think it is, uh, it, is an, it is an appropriate thing to do. And Mr. Ngugi, do you think that slavery looms as large in the African imagination as it does in the American imagination? I think it's important, uh, and although people may not be talking about it in the streets every other day, but it's a, a very important element you know, of uh, the African you know, conceptualization of uh, life uh, and our relationship to the uh, West. It is important. Do you think what the president said, Mr. Ngugi, was appropriate about slavery while he was in Africa? I think it is a move in the right direction to recognize the uh, American uh, or American responsibility in this area. But I was frankly very surprised that they raised some hesitation in um, offering a formal apology. And it's not really enough to say this was wrong. It's the more important to come out with policies that you know, ensure that uh, the wrongs that arise from that um, uh, history are righted, both for African American peoples here and also for African peoples. Uh -huh. Ms. Miyangwa, how do you see that, the comments the president made about slavery in the past and other wrongs committed in Africa in the past? Um, I would agree with uh, Mr. Ngugiwa Thiongo on this. I think it's an important first step, particularly as we have reached a time in our relations where the U.S. would like stronger and closer relationships with Africans and vice versa. I think it's an, in, an important step that must be taken. We have to understand how we got where, where we are today in order for us to be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Mr. Lezepo, how do you see his comments about the past, and especially about slavery? Yeah, for the history lesson, I think it was very important. But when we think about the present, I don't think the African have on their mind slavery. Uh, the president's re remarks were for American consumption, and, uh, but from the African perspective, it doesn't mean so much. Mm -hmm. Not so important to Africans. Not so much important. Uh, most of us uh, are not so much aware of slavery as it is in, um, in the New World. Now, there is an African proverb <laughs> uh, that will say the person who is hurt will always remember um, much more so the hurt. But. Uh, it looks like uh, in this area of slavery, the traditional African consciousness has tabooed knowledge. So there is not so much knowledge about it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Achebe, your novels are all about telling Africa's story. Um, and, and 
differently than people from the outside were telling Africa's story. Has this trip, in your view, played, have gone, has it been able to change the perception in Americans' minds about Africa? Do you think it will be able to do that at all? Well, I hope uh, it will be a beginning. Um, the, uh, the attitude uh, and the impression uh, that people have towards Africa uh, is generally very deep-seated. Uh, a lot of it grounded perhaps in guilt. And, uh, and therefore, I do not expect uh, anything, not even this visit, good as it is, uh, I don't expect it to uh, bring about a radical change overnight. But it is necessary that we begin. It is absolutely essential that we begin to make the right moves. And I would like to um, just say something else about, about the apology. Um, it is far more important uh, to do the right thing now uh, than the apology itself. The apology is something which um, you know, must come from the person who has done the wrong. If he feels that way, uh, it's really not um, for me to say it is necessary. But I, I would prefer to see uh, an amendment of life, a new attitude to Africa, a perception of Africa as a place of humanity, not a place for safari, not a place where you run when you are in trouble, uh, not where you make... Um, you create uh, fanciful symbols. Africa is, is a home of people uh, and, and a home of, uh, of, of humans. It is their humanity that was, that was um, challenged by the slave trade. And it is their humanity that they managed to hang on to through the, the centuries of slavery. And that is the heroic part of the story. Hmm. Mr. Ngugi, do you think the trip plays any role in getting that view across to Americans? You know, for, for, oh, only time obviously will tell. But you know, I, I think and I agree with that position that it is important that uh, this visit was actually made. And if it helps people in changing their conceptions of Africa, that would be very, very important because it is true that Africa must not be seen only in terms of, say, uh, wild life and uh, safari. Um, but at the same time, in terms of how the trip was represented on American television, there were some disturbing comments which, though not necessarily or not consciously meant to be uh, harmful, but you can see how they are rooted. Like in what? Well, for instance, you know, the ABC uh, presentation of uh, 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 the present visit and the session in Ghana, we had a very wonderful shot, you know, visual impression of Ghanaians coming in full force to dance and so on. And then comes the editorial comment by Sam Donaldson uh, about the dances. And the comment, comment is, uh, uh, here was tribal Africa in display. Why tribal? Why not Ghanaian dancers? Why not Ghanaian dancers in display? Why not African dancers in display? Or whatever other, you know, terms that, you know, uh, do not call it, carry the, um, uh, some of these very uh, negative uh, images mm -hmm. or the stock images through which Africa tends to be seen, you know, uh, like tribe, safari and all that. Uh, and Ms. Mayangwa, do you agree with that? And what do you think are the main perceptions, uh, misperceptions Americans have of Africa? Um, well, I just want to go back a little bit to what the President's visit to Africa has done for us in terms of um, putting the spotlight on Africa. I think he has given us uh, some wonderful momentum uh, to some degree, and that it's up to us, whether it's Africans living on the continent or Africans living here in the U.S., the various Africa-interested organizations, Africa-focused organization, to pick up on that momentum and capitalize on it to keep, this, to keep Africa firmly in the spotlight. So we have to pick up from where he's left off. That's our responsibility. In terms of the images, um, 
I was a little disturbed too by some of the images. There is this, um, the exotic Africa, people kept going back to that, the dances, the tribal dances, uh, the tribalism in Africa especially. This is a very big problem in terms of how people perceive Africa, therefore, um, which warps their analysis of what's going on in Africa and ends up sometimes coming up with uh, the wrong policies towards Africa. For example, we look at Rwanda, we look at any of the conflicts going on in Africa, we call them tri tribal conflicts. And yet a similar kind of conflict has been going on in Bosnia, but that's not tribal, that's ethnic, and for some reason that's different. I think uh, conflict everywhere, whether it's in Africa, it's in Europe, dehumanizes all of us, and it's, up, it's our responsibility to understand how these things happen and to take corrective action. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Lazeppo, in your own work, speaking of what people, what you, all of you I'm talking to here can do, how do you see perceptions of Africa change as people come into contact with your music? You're a musician, you teach music, you play many African instruments. There is a, a change going on. When I came here in 1973, some of the only places available for me to perform, or let me say, people point the outdoor for me, go outdoor and play down there. That is where the music and dance is played in Africa. But then, if the ballet, the modern dance, are all in concert halls, I don't see why I cannot be in the concert halls. Right now we are in the concert halls. Mm. Um, and uh, we are sharing the African perspective forcefully, with pride and with dignity. Um, we will keep doing that. Um, there is always going to be um, ignorance, insensitivity, and so forth. But we must be able to try to overcome that and say, here I am. I'm just like you. I'm a human being. And Mr. Achebe and your people, many teachers use your novels to give people a view of Africa, uh, from an African. How do you see people's views change in your class as they read novels? Oh, um, well, literature is a very, very powerful um, means of bringing about the kind of uh, change, the necessary change that we are talking about. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the bad image of Africa was largely created by literature. Uh, the, the writings of, of Europeans over a period of 400 years depicting the African uh, in a way to suggest that his enslavement and later his colonization was inevitable. Uh, therefore, the correction uh, uh, which literature can bring into this debate is, is of, of, of great importance. And um, I find uh, that reading stories, stories of human beings from other parts of the world is, is the quickest way of getting into those societies and those minds and, uh, and seeing them as people. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ngugi, what about in your experience? Yes, yeah, first of all, uh, a little bit uh, go back to the question of conception and uh, misconception about Africa. Uh, I think one of the biggest misconceptions people have about Africa is, for reasons in terms of its economic relationship to the West, and there's a tendency of seeing Africa as a beggar, you know, whereas in reality, if you look at the economic relationship between the West and Africa, Africa has always been the giver, you know, and the West actually, you know, uh, taking from Africa. Whether you look at the, say, the mineral resources in Africa, you know, even if we don't mention the question of slavery, if you look simply at the question of uh, mineral resources in Africa, mm -hmm. or at the question of debt servicing, you know, so that for every, say, 20 units of uh, of wealth that is born into Africa, about nine, you know, about <laughs> uh, over three quarters of that, you know, comes back to the West in terms of debt servicing, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the even the president himself mentioned the fact that you know the return on uh, on investing in, in Africa is uh, much higher than other places, and this is true. The rate of profit in Africa is much higher. Uh, 
uh, the, in other words, they invest, they get much bigger returns. But actually what remains in Africa, what goes to develop Africa itself, you know, uh, is fairly minimal. Uh -huh. I, so, I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm afraid we're out of time, Mr. Ngugi, and I want to thank you all very much for being with us.